Led Zeppelin's history is clouded with legend and folklore, and today we're busting a lot of myths surrounding the band. From epic songs to their alleged pact with Satan, here are a few false things you might believe about Led Zeppelin. One of the most persistent rumors swirling around Led Zeppelin is their supposed Satanism, including the rumor that they sold their souls in exchange for their immense success. This rumor was inspired by three things. There was lead guitarist Jimmy Page's interest in the occult, specifically occult leader Aleister Crowley. There was the band's refusal to ever issue any sort of denial, likely because they felt the rumors only added to their allure. And then there was the crazy idea that they were backwards messages, praising Satan hidden in their songs, including Stairway to Heaven. The band's image didn't help either. Between Page's obsession with witchcraft and singer Rubber Plant's fascination with Lord of the Rings, not to mention their notoriously hard-driving rock and roll lifestyle in the early 1970s, Satanism didn't seem out of place. But while Page's personal philosophy lined up with Crowley's do what thou wilt mantra, Crowley himself wasn't actually a Satanist, and there's zero evidence that Page or anyone else in the band was either. Led Zeppelin certainly isn't the only band rumored to have embedded secret backwards messages in their songs through a technique known as backward masking, but they're pretty closely associated with the alleged activity. While rumors of Satanism and other occult practices swirled around the band almost since their inception, the idea that they were using these backwards messages to subliminally influence the impressionable teen fans didn't spread into the early 1980s. That's when the anti-rock televangelist Paul Crouch began talking about the technique. The most famous example of these supposed messages is in Stairway to Heaven. Supposedly, if you play the early part of the song backwards, you can hear plants singing lines that begin and it sure does sound like that when you play it backwards. Kind of. If you use your imagination, which is the point? See, there are various psychological reasons we think we hear something coherent in what is clearly a slur of backwards sound. Human beings are primed to seek meaning from sounds, even if they're not actually forming words. By the time Led Zeppelin released their fourth album in 1971, they were arguably the biggest band in the world. Their combination of heavy guitars, blues-influenced rock, and extreme technical capabilities had made them hugely popular, and the album remains the best-selling record in their catalog. After all, it contains both Black Dog and Stairway to Heaven, the two Led Zeppelin songs that even people who hate Led Zeppelin know. Now, you probably think the title of the album is Led Zeppelin 4, or Zoso, or an unpronounced series of symbols. But you're wrong. The album has no title at all. The album cover also doesn't identify the band in any way. And they were advised that this was professional suicide. But as it turned out, it was the opposite. According to Rolling Stone, Jimmy Page refused to title the album, in part to get back at rock music journalists and reviewers he'd come to view as enemies due to incessant bad press and poor reviews. He figured having an untitled album would make it more difficult for them to write about. The fact that the packaging also enhanced the band's mysterious image was probably also a motivating factor. To this day, people swear they saw Led Zeppelin perform live on television in the 1970s, which would be news to the band. The band did perform a very, very early show on Danish television back when they were still known as the New Yardbirds in 1969. They even appeared on Japanese television later that same year. But once they were the band we recognize as Led Zeppelin, they were done with TV. Zeppelin's infamous manager, Peter Grant, refused to allow the band to appear on television because he regarded it as a giveaway. He wanted people to buy a ticket for a concert, not see one for free in their living rooms. And yet, the rumor persists because, in a way, Led Zeppelin was on TV on a show called Don Kirshner's Rock Concert, which featured bands playing live back in the days before MTV. On September 29, 1976, the show aired footage from Zeppelin's concert movie. The song remains the same. Plenty of people with murky memories of this event will swear that Zeppelin played live, but it isn't true. The band never appeared on TV after March 1969. It's easy to understand why there might be some confusion over the credits of a lot of Led Zeppelin songs. After all, the band had a bad habit of adapting old blues songs and conveniently forgetting to credit the original artists, leading to a flurry of lawsuits over the years. But if you bought a copy of their debut album and came away believing that their hit song, Babe, I'm Gonna Leave You, is a traditional folk song that Jimmy Page arranged, you were bamboozled. And it turns out, so were they. The band first heard the song because they were huge fans of Joan Baez, and she played the song in her shows all the time. She even included it on her 1962 album, Joan Baez in Concert, where she mistakenly credited it as traditional, meaning it had no author. 
When Zeppelin reworked the song for their debut album, they used the same listing, crediting Page for their arrangement only. But the song was actually written in the late 1950s by Ann Breeden, who drifted out of the folk music scene and was completely unaware of Zeppelin's version until a decade after it was released. Considering they were one of the biggest bands of all time, and yet were only together for 12 short years, it's not surprising that a Led Zeppelin reunion is high on a lot of rock fans' wish lists, with the exception of a few live performances for charity. However, the three surviving members of the band, Jimmy Page, Robert Plant, and John Paul Jones, have never agreed to a formal reunion. That holdout makes the rumor that Richard Branson offered them $800 million to get the band back together in 2014 believable enough. The details of the rumor are a little strange. Supposedly, it would have involved hundreds of concerts but only three cities, and Branson intended to use his expertise in the airline industry to recreate Zeppelin's legendary touring plane, the Starship. The rumor goes on to claim that Robert Plant, who's never been interested in a full-scale reunion, considered the offer for a night, then theatrically ripped up the contract in front of everyone the next morning. But it turns out none of this is true. Both the band and Branson confirmed that it was just a rumor, no doubt boosted by legions of fans thirsty for a Zeppelin comeback. Even if your musical tastes range as far, far from the 1970s hard rock, you know the drums from Led Zeppelin's 1971 song, When the Levee Breaks. The drums have an epic echo and delay that makes the sound absolutely massive, and other artists have been sampling the beat for decades. What you probably believe about this drum track is that Jimmy Page got that huge sound by putting John Bonham's drum set in a stairway at a drafty old cottage the band was recording in, Headley Grange. According to legend, the massive reverb is all natural, the result of the room's acoustic qualities and not any sort of effects device. This is the hall where the uh, drums were set up and where, where Levy Breaks was recorded. Unfortunately, it doesn't appear to be true, even though there are multiple interviews where Jimmy Page perpetuates the story. According to Andy Johns, the recording engineer who worked on the song, they used a device called a Benson Echo Rec to give the drums that sound. Still, that doesn't make the track or the drumming any less incredible. Led Zeppelin was huge, and they still are. According to Forbes, they've sold over 300 million albums. They're also one of a handful of bands that have had name recognition outside their given genre and time period. And they're part of an even shorter list of bands from that era whose music is still widely played and sampled. Some of those songs are so recognizable, so embedded in pop culture, that it's easy to understand why people think they had at least one number one song. But they never did. First of all, they didn't release a lot of singles because their manager, Peter Grant, wanted to force people to shell out for the entire album if they liked the song. In fact, they only released 10 songs that made the Billboard charts at all. And the closest to number one they ever got was when Whole Lot of Love hit number four in January of 1970. You may think the name Led Zeppelin was meant to sound cool, but that's only because they made it cool. It was originally a joke. By the late 1960s, Jimmy Page was an established, successful musician who played on plenty of recordings by big-name artists like The Who, The Kinks, and The Rolling Stones. In 1966, he joined the Yardbirds with his old friend Jeff Beck. Just before that, he played guitar for a song Beck was recording as a solo artist, with Keith Moon from The Who on drums and fellow session musician John Paul Jones on bass. Page looked at the talent around the room and thought about forming a supergroup of established genius musicians. According to legend, when he pitched the idea, Moon joked that they should call the band Led Zeppelin because it would go down like a lead balloon. A few years later, Page began putting together the supergroup after the Yardbirds broke up, recruiting singer Robert Plant, Jones, and drummer John Bonham. The band originally toured Europe as the new Yardbirds as they rehearsed and perfected their performance. According to writer Mick Wall, when the band returned to America, Page got a cease and desist letter from the Yardbirds guitarist Chris Dreja, who claimed to have legal rights to the band name. Page remembered Moon's joke from a few years before and decided to call the band Led Zeppelin, changing the spelling from L-E-A-D to L-E-D because he worried people would mispronounce the first word. You can't be blamed if you think Led Zeppelin straight up stole the intro Stairway to Heaven from a band called Spirit. For one thing, the list of musicians Led Zeppelin allegedly stole from isn't exactly short. As Rolling Stone notes, the band has been successfully sued over songs such as Dazed and Confused, Whole Lot of Love, and Boogie with Stew. 
for another. The band's been embroiled in a lawsuit over Stairway since 2014 with the estate of Randy Wolf, whose band Spirit released a song called Taurus in 1968, several years before Stairway. If you listen to the two songs side by side, similarities are obvious, but the band denies being aware of Taurus. And to be fair, in other cases where the band's been accused of borrowing elements of their songs, they've usually admitted it and expressed exasperation before eventually giving credit or settling a lawsuit. Plus, as The Guardian reported a few years ago, music experts say that both songs are using centuries-old structures and chord progressions that are being reused to this day. In other words, Zeppelin can't be guilty of stealing this particular bit because what they're really guilty of is being very, very basic when it comes to their music composition skills. Bach used it. Uh, you can find it in dozens of pieces. That's certainly better than paying Wolf's estate the $55 million that Forbes estimates the song is worth. Robert Plant is known for the mystical, slightly goofy lyrics he writes. But if you look at the credits for Led Zeppelin's first album, you probably think he didn't write any of the material because he has no credits whatsoever. That isn't true, though. In fact, it's kind of impossible. The band's songwriting was usually a collaboration, and Plant was a very improvisational singer. So imagining he had absolutely nothing to do with the composition of the songs on the first album is kind of strange. Plus, Plant was already a songwriter in his own right back then, and he never seemed especially shy about expressing his own creative vision. The truth is, Plant probably should have been credited as co-writer on most of the songs from the first album. The problem was, he was still under contract with CBS Records for the previous projects, and thus was legally prevented from being part of an Atlantic Records deal. As a result, his name was officially left off the composition credits for technical reasons. Check out one of our newest videos right here. Plus, even more grunge videos about your favorite bands are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.